we spent the past couple years in a crazy hot market. Louisville home sales decline as demand outpaces supply. Effective communication is at the core of any situation. If you master these two ideas, you'll have a chance of being a successful at residential real estate marketing. I think you need to be looking for investment opportunities that move the needle. The market will never crash if demand exceeds supply. This is what I've been telling you all along. This is the Jay Pitt Show. And we're back, folks. Welcome back to the Jay Pitts Show here on Talk Radio 1080. I'm your host, Jay Pitts, here with my co-host, Mr. Ryan Harris. I got a nice little smile as I'm bringing the show in. I don't know. Did I flub my words? No, I'm just, I'm telling you, we need that on a t-shirt. What's that? Welcome back, folks. Oh, yeah. Welcome back. That's my Jay, that's and my we're Jay back. impression. And we're back, folks. That's, I don't know. I don't know why I say that. It just kind of rolls. I think it's great. You know, it is what it is. Can something be said for consistency of communication, right? It's an intro. It's an intro. So what are we doing today? I don't know. We're sitting in here. There's a storm of brewing outside. You have a new truck. You're a little worried it's, about it. Yeah, you know. I mean, when you buy a truck kind of quickly becomes like, you know, part of your body. Like you, you, you once it's new, it's like, eh, you know, I don't want it to get hurt. Then after a few weeks, it's like. It's just like getting a scab on your elbow. It looks good. Really fun. It does look good. I like it. I like it. I'm excited. I got a good deal. Good deal. You'll know this. You, you got to know this about me. Like the deal matters. Like getting a good deal on something really matters to me. I'll tell you, growing up, there was there was a year where my dad bought a new car every month or just about. <laughs> he was always known for just buying new cars. I'm, I'm, I don't. I, I really don't. I This is my third F-150 in a row. Um, You know. I bought one in 2012, right after my son was born, my first child. I drove it 200,000 miles. I sold it about a year ago when I got a 2018 F-150. That one has done me well. I am doing a little tax strategery here with this purchase. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the one I got in 18. It's about 80,000 miles, but it's at a position where the value is about to start going down substantially. So I could probably sell it, make some decent money. Put that towards the new one, get a big write off because you know the new the new F one fifty Lightning, which is what I got, is over six thousand pounds. First thing, consult a CPA. <laughs> but Section one one seventy nine of the tax code allows for rapid depreciation of a vehicle used primarily for business use over if it's over six thousand pounds. Again, you know, consult a CPA. But I'm going to get a little write off. Um, you know, good situation. Yeah. Can't and I got more deal. than that. I got a good deal. I bought a 2023, but I bought it used. You haven't even said what you bought. I bought a Ford F-150 Lightning, a 2023, oh. all electric. Okay. So I'm no longer stopping at Thornton's and putting $4 a gallon gasoline in my, uh, in my gas guzzler. But you know, I, I mean, still am electric, electric burns a lot of fossil fuel too. So I'm not going to pretend to be like a, <laughs> like a climate warrior here. But what I'm saying is, uh, I don't have to do that anymore. It's really fast and fun. Um, and it looks like a truck, uh, like a good looking truck, not like the Tesla truck that looks like it's straight out of Mad Max, yeah. which those of you that have followed the podcast that now follow us on the radio as well would know I'm a big fan of the Tesla Cybertruck. Also, it just might be like three more, three or four more years before I could actually get my hands on one. Yeah, Elon got that $200 deposit from you. He got it. He, he got it from got, a lot of people. He still got it. He got it from a mil, 1.5 million people. Yeah. Non-refundable. Non Is that what it was? 200 no, or 100? No, it, was, it was 100. 100. It was 100 non-refundable. But, you know, it was a good, that was a good, so I've got my reservation like the first week of COVID. Like I'm at home, as you can imagine, you know my schedule and how I do. I'll go, 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 go. And then all of a sudden I'm at home. Yeah, I remember when that when that happened. It was almost like, okay, everybody watch the same Netflix show. Okay, everybody reserve their Tesla Cybertruck. That's exactly what happened. Man. <laughs> Nothing else to do. I like. I'm sitting at home when I'm normally like you know running a hundred miles an hour all day every day, and all of a sudden I have like nothing to do, and so like I'm just goofing around online, and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna reserve a Cybertruck. Yeah, well, cool. I, uh, we've had some bad storms lately. We have that it's one kind of Sunday. Weird. It was kind of wild. It was knocked out a lot of power for a lot of folks. A lot of our, a couple of our agents actually live in the same neighborhood, Holiday Manor area. Um, pretty, you know, Louisville's got a lot of old mature trees and, oh. and, and a lot of above ground utilities. Yeah. So what you end up seeing is anytime we have a bad storm with high winds, a lot of people lose power. Yeah. Um, I am thankful to be in a part of town that is a little bit newer with underground utilities. So I don't tend to lose power. It's always a scary time for agents with listings or buyers under contract. 
Especially if you have a bunch of new constructions, you got to go check them out. Yeah, got a uh, got a got a note this morning on a transaction. An institutional seller saying, "Hey, we're canceling your deal because uh, you know we understand per the contract we have to deliver the property in similar condition, and a tree branch fell on the house, and it's going to be too much, and we're not going to fix it." <laughs> Basically, is what they said, and that was the seller, not even the buyer, demanding that the seller fix it. Like the seller just said, "Hey." We think you're going to demand that we fix it, so we're just going to cancel the deal. Mm-hmm. So at least the buyer didn't get stuck for trying to buy something, which you don't have to. Legally, you don't have to. If you're, you know, it would be a really, really one-sided contract for a buyer to be forced to buy something that's damaged during, mm-hmm. the, during the part, the, you know, the processing of the contract. Yep. All right. Uh, let's jump into today's show. I will start out by saying I had the day completely wrong for the basketball tournament. <laughs> it's uh, next month. Yeah, so. that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. We'll get back to it. That was last week's episode, folks. We were talking about a couple of U of L greats. It's called the basketball tournament, correct? It is, and you know, it is alumni from different universities around the country that play in a, you know, post career basketball tournament. Uh, I think we have Luke Hancock, we have Peyton Siva, we have Russ Smith playing for the University of Louisville. But yeah, seven twenty five. What did you say? I don't remember. I said it was last going to be. Uh, Tuesday of this week. Tuesday so, of this week. Two days ago. So a little off there, but that's yeah, okay. I was looking for news. I saw no news and nobody talked about it and oh, uh, ended up looking up. I was like, I completely butchered that, but yeah, it's okay. All right. We do that talking sometimes. Cool. Let's go to uh consumer, consumer questions. Yeah. So, you know, we were doing agents, you know, agent right. questions Question right then, the but we've also had consumers asking some questions and I think they apply to not only consumers and agents as well, they can learn from these. So I think these are better questions. We'll start doing consumer real estate questions. Hey, Jay, <laughs> that's what I'm calling it. So uh, we have a couple here. I'll start with the first one. And, you know, this consumer must know, they must know you invest, you renovate homes, right. you've done a lot of flipping. And they, here's their question. Hey, Jay, I'm about to renovate my home. What mistakes should I make sure to avoid? So... Age, you know, age old question when it comes to real estate. Um, what I'll say is there's a term and I'm going to do a little, little glossary, uh, little glossary. We can take this into the next segment. Yeah, too. absolutely. So, so what you want to avoid is, is something called functional obsolescence. Okay. And those of you that are real estate agents or have studied real estate or gone to real estate school will know that's one of those terms that you seldom hear after real estate school, but it's actually quite prevalent to see out in the marketplace. So for example, functional obsolescence means exactly what the base word sounds like it would mean. It's functionally obsolete. Function is obsolete. You don't want to over improve. That's essentially what functional obsolescence uh, obsolescence is. You don't want a $200,000 pool in a neighborhood of $200,000 homes. So if you're updating and upgrading, um, know what your surroundings are. It's okay to be slightly nicer than the competition. I wouldn't break the budget to do so, though. Focus your energy and attention on the things that get the highest return on investment. Bathrooms, kitchens, and adding square footage. Those are the things. Finished basements are great, but your finish in the basement should not mirror the finish on the main level or on the above-grade finished square footage. You can have a slight step down in quality in terms of level of finish. You know, I wouldn't go and, you know, in a in a $200,000 house, you know, put like, you know, a, a $10,000 set of like built-ins for your man cave, right? You need to understand what your home is and what it isn't, okay? You know, adding on square footage is always welcome because you get above grade price per square foot additions. Uh, so that's great. Renovating kitchens is great. You know, it certain certain updates and upgrades have become almost like necessary at this point. Like like for mica countertops are pretty much out. You can get granite, you can get solid surface tops really cost effectively now. So those are those are a good bang for your buck. You know, anything going away from carpet to hard flooring or hard service flooring, um, I think is a good idea. Cool. Do you think there's any neighborhoods in Louisville or areas where functional obsolescence doesn't necessarily exist? Like I'm trying to think of some. I feel like Crescent Hill is almost one. There's just so many different kinds of houses there, all different price points. Yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm thinking of that area. There, there's a house that was really, really, uh, you know, I want to say infamous. It didn't want to sell for quite some time. It's like a shotgun house on like Payne Street where they had done like 
an arboretum kind of addition with like an in ground lap pool, like on a on a on a shotgun lot. You know, so like that's certainly functionally obsolescent, right? And mm-hmm. and it sold for substantially less than probably what the cost was to add that, you know, amenity. But you're right. Certainly, the more the character the neighborhood has, the less functionally obsolescent it will be. You'll see some things that are just completely and utterly um, impractical that work because the location is almost irreplaceable that people with a lot of money... Okay, and an ability to do certain things and desires will do it and other people will appreciate it just simply because of the location. So so if you have an irreplaceable location, if you're suburban and in, in a very homogenous neighborhood, it's easy to be functionally obsolescent. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want a seven bedroom house in a neighborhood full of three bed, one and a half baths. Yeah. That's functional obsolescence. Oh cool. Uh, all right, we're gonna cut to a couple ad sponsors and we have another consumer real estate question when we come back. This is the Jay Pitt Show. I'm your co-host, Ryan Harris. Talk Radio 1080, Real News, Real Talk. See you in a sec. Welcome back to the Jay Pitt Show. I'm your co-host, Ryan Harris. This is Talk Radio 1080. All right, Jay, we were just talking about, you know, this, this consumer asked, they're renovating their home. What mistakes should they make sure to avoid? I think we wrapped that up pretty yeah. well. Um, I agree. I agree. I would say functional obsolescence doesn't really exist, though, if you plan on living there your whole life. That, that's a, that's also true. I mean, you can certainly afford to do things that are your preference more when you don't plan on selling. Functional obsolescence has to do with resale. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, it, it, it's it, functional obsolescence is obsolete if you never sell. You don't have to worry about it. But but you know, do you really want to make that investment and not have the ability to sell? I think I think it, most people have to consider it. Yeah, for sure. All right. We actually have another question. I thought it was a really good one. Um, actually, heard some agents even talking about this in the office uh, today. Mm-hmm. So really, this came from two different places. So, so what happens if someone is under contract to buy a home and the seller dies? Yeah. So this actually happened. It actually happened twice to us. We had the seller on one. We had the buyer on the other. Excuse me. We had the seller and the seller died on one. We had the buyer and the seller died. So it was only our client once. Um, so it, it's pretty direct, actually. Um, and, and it pertains to contract law. And again, not an attorney, not a CPA. Please consult professionals. Always have to disclaim that. Real estate school scared me to death. Said don't practice law if you're not a lawyer. So I am not and I will not. But here's what I'll tell you. Um, if the principal to a contract um, is deceased, okay, in most cases, okay, I won't say in most cases, if the contract does not provide for what happens under that circumstance, which is always an option in a contract, um, the more detailed, the more likely that there is a provision that that calls for it. Um, if it does say that the contract is null and void upon the death of one of the members or one of the principals, then obviously the contract is 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 done. If it does not, then typically the contractual interest that exists in either party, in this case the seller, passes to their heirs. Okay, the problem is, and in this situation where we had, we had the buyer. The buyer agrees to purchase a home. The seller is is now deceased. Um, is who can act upon that act upon that right that passes through to their estate? Do they have a will? Do they not? If they do, and an, and, and an executor can be or executrix can be appointed. There's time that goes in to play there, right? If the contract is near its expiration date, which this one was, then nobody is uh, is authorized to extend the purchase contract, right? While we wait for the court to to appoint someone who can act upon the contract. So again, w- let's say we've got five days left on a contract, okay? There is no time as the essence verbiage in the contract, so it can go past the expiration date, but only for a, you know, uh, only for a short period of time, two weeks-ish. So when we get, you know, 20 days past this person's death, the contract no longer exists because no one is authorized to extend it. So unfortunate. Um, One thing I should say, a caveat is that is a bilateral contract that is binding between two principles, two parties, a buyer and a seller, a personal service contract, like a listing contract. Okay. Um, it, It ceases to exist upon the passing of one of the parties. So for example, the listing contract between that listing broker and their client who, who passed away, 
now no longer exists. So so think about the situation that our agent's in. He's got a buyer, mm-hmm. okay, who wants to buy the house. It's almost to the expiration date. The seller dies. He wants to close. He can't close because nobody has is authorized to close. They can't extend because nobody's authorized to extend. And also, that agent no longer works for for that property. Okay, that listing agent is no longer because their personal service contract is terminated upon the death of their client. So it's a mess is the answer. But uh, ultimately, if all parties are in good, you know, want to act in good faith, then we can kind of wait and see and. Where do you think that one goes? I think that one probably dies. Pardon. (laughs) I think that contract probably goes south. It does not close. Um, I think the buyer probably gets impatient and knows that it's going to be some time before they're able to get what they want. And they probably, probably move on and buy something else. So who, who's going to take control of that property? Uh, the estate, the estate owns it. Mm -hmm. The estate owns the property. So, you know, I believe, I believe after researching the specific situation that there was, there was an heir. The heir is the executor and the executor will take control once court appoints them, the, you know, the right to do so. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, man. It's, 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 it's it doesn't sticky, happen very often. It, does it? it doesn't, but when it does, it's always interesting. I mean, out of all the homes you've sold, your brokerage has sold. It's I, only happened twice. I, well, no, I've had I've had a few others <laughs> okay. over the years, but okay. it, it's it's pretty yeah, it's pretty seldom. Yeah, all I've right. had I've had bu- I've had buyers pass away as well mm-hmm. during transactions. I've had I've had buyers lose jobs. I've had you know I've had buyers go missing. Right. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, I had somebody missing once. Yeah, our old had friend Gabe Pruitt. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting story. I don't want to. I don't remember the fine details of that one. So really, I've had people go missing. I've had people get arrested. Gabe had one get arrested too. I remember the one about Gabe with the person yeah. getting. They disappeared and ended up calling them back a few months later. Only reason I remember this, right. I, I had a podcast called Agent Anonymous, right? Where I had agents on and tell their crazy stories. Uh, we could we should, we should tell some of those one day. We, we we should. That would be a good idea. Yeah. I will say this. Here's another one. Another as long as we're talking crazy stories. I had a client go under contract to buy a piece of property, okay, and then um, get arrested and become incarcerated and and closed. Wow. They closed on the purchase from while being incarcerated. Were they jail, prison? They were in jail awaiting trial. And somebody and, went there. And it, and it was a small, a, a smaller price, a, a smaller price. I don't know. That, that, it was, you know. It was a cash purchase. They mm-hmm. had the cash, and the notary went to the prison, and they bought a house at, from from jail. It wasn't prison; it was jail. I, if I was the agent, I would have gone just to do it. I, it was yeah. uh, it was an interesting experience. That's I awesome. Say. I didn't personally go, but I heard lots of stories, and I gave some some advice. Oh, was it your client? It was not my client. Okay, no. it was one of our agents' clients. Gotcha. So yeah. Oh, I definitely would have gone. Yeah, became incarcerated. We'll not talk about what this gentleman allegedly did. Um, we'll leave that, but, um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I don't know if it's awesome, Ryan, but it's, it's a story. <laughs> That's for sure. You closed it. We did close That's it. Cool. We did close it. That was uh, cool. All right. I, I actually want to revisit the first question a little mm-hmm. bit mm-hmm. that we had, you know, I'm about to renovate my home. What mistakes should I make sure to avoid? Okay. I think a lot of consumers also have the question of, I'm, uh, I'm getting ready to sell. I'm not quite ready yet, but what renovate what have, what renovation should I make, and you know how do I know that before selling? Yeah, um, it kind of. I mean, it, that is very challenging, and it takes a professional. And I hate to give the like realtor's answer to that, but it really depends on what upside you have. It depends on the moment in time that you're buying. It depends on how much you're trying to upgrade. You know, because the truth is, you can spend. You can spend ten thousand dollars getting your home ready to sell and get ten thousand in return. You can spend ten thousand sometimes and get twenty thousand in return. Um, it, it's not finite. It, it, this is one of the probably the best arguments, the it, most difficult arguments to make to people who are skeptical of what a real estate agent does. But the real mm-hmm. a realtor's intuition and and intimate market knowledge really really plays well here. If you have it it really gives the client an advantage because they don't know and they're flying blind and they're spending real dollars and they just don't know. Um, I will tell you this. I tell sellers oftentimes, if you think you should paint, paint. 
If you think you should have carpets cleaned, have carpets cleaned. If you think you should replace carpet, you should replace carpet. You might even consider vinyl luxury vinyl tile or vinyl plank or even ceramic tile as or hardwood floors or five eighths engineered laminate hardwood. Whatever, whatever upgrade from carpet that you're considering, you may you may heavily consider that. Um, if you think you should declutter, declutter. If you think you should put things in storage, put things in storage. There, if you think you should refresh landscaping, landscaping, do it. Like these are items that almost never have negative return on investment. Almost never. Okay. Now, a complete kitchen remodel, you may spend 50 grand and get 40 back. Yeah. And if you're planning on selling in six months, then you shouldn't be doing and and you're not 100% certain. Now, and, and it has to do with relative functional obsolescence, which is the kind of term we, we introduced last segment. It has to do with that too, because if you have, you know, a $750,000 house with a, in this market with a subpar kitchen, Okay, and and I'm assuming it's 750 with the subpar kitchen. Well, it might be 825 with a fifty thousand dollar kitchen remodel. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's much less likelihood that a fifty thousand dollar kitchen remodel is going to get you dollar for dollar return, much less a positive return on investment if you're at 300k. Yeah. So those are things to consider, and and I'm giving broad strokes. And I wish I could give more specifics, but it really, really comes down to a professional's opinion. You should consult and get one. Yeah. You also have to consider, let's say you're making a $50,000 kitchen upgrade and you can get 75000 more for the home. Is it really worth living through that renovation for, I mean, that $50,000 kitchen renovation is going to take a couple months. It absolutely would. And do you want to live through that? for two months and make 25,000 more. I'm sure some people would. Some people would, some people wouldn't. If you're, if you're expecting a child in, in that same, you know, three months, yeah, maybe not. And nowadays, if you're having to eat out for those two months, you're probably spending $25,000 <laughs> eating out. <laughs> so, but groceries are expensive too. As, as a oh father, gosh. as a father of three, I will tell you, there's no, there's no cheap way to eat these days. I mean, ramen is expensive. There's really not. I've seen the hacks of just buying large quantities and buy a, si- it, a side of beef and cut it, <laughs> cutting your own steaks off. <laughs> That's right. Beef. Yeah, absolutely. I thought about buying half a cow. Did you really? You I'm got like, a big deep freeze? Um, I'll have to get one. Okay. But now I got the Blackstone. The Blackstone's you know. legit, man. And, I, uh, I use a, I've got a Weber and I've got a big black, an actual black stone that sits on my Weber. Cool. I use it. I use it a lot. So, but I, I just didn't want another standalone. It's so easy. It is easy. I love it. I mean, it's bre- fun. Breakfast sandwiches is the my favorite on the weekend. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure your kids I'm love it. Chef. Of, I'm the goat of breakfast sandwiches. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can't have, call yourself the goat. I I, I just did. I just did. Well, and because you did, we're going to cut to a break, <laughs> and we'll be back on the Jay Pitt Show, Talk Radio 1080, Real News, Real Talk. See you in a sec. We're back, folks. Thank you for coming back after the break. I, you know, we need to revisit this idea of calling yourself the GOAT, or the greatest of all time, for those of you that don't are not aware of what the GOAT means. My, Which, my that son, term is used way too my much son, nowadays. It's absolutely. My, my son, They, you know, they, they use it as a verb. Is it a, an adverb? I don't know. I'm not great with, with grammar, but he says goaded. Things are goaded. Something's such and such is goaded. And I'm like, for real? Anyway, I've he, said it. He, you said it. Something's good. It okay. Well, I, apparently, have I'm, you noticed? You have you ever picked up any lingo from your kids and started saying it? No, but like I hear them saying things that I hear on social that are t- is too young for me. You know, like uh, I'm not gonna make I'm not gonna make fun of myself right now. I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna give uh, too many too many examples. But yeah, he he def- he said bet to me yesterday. He said bet, and I said, dude, you are ten. You gotta stop this. Is he's he like, just to pick it up at school. He does. Sports and he said, teams. He said sports is his little buddies. He said bet. And I said, I said, hey, Preston, will you get me something or other? He said bet. And I, said, <laughs> I said, bro, you got to stop. You got to stop right now. Has he said mid yet? He has not said mid. He has not said bussin. He has not said any of that. <laughs> Nothing slaps. We're not doing any of that. You should start saying those to him and see what he does. I, I'll do it every once in a while just to give it. He gets really embarrassed. We'll like pull into his baseball games. We'll roll the windows down on the truck and bust music real loud. And he just like gets so embarrassed. And my wife and I, we just, we die. We love it. Yeah. You, you'll get there. You'll be there soon. You'll yep. be there soon. All right. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not going to revisit. We, we'll talk. We'll talk another time if there's, if there's a moment. But what, what is it that I'm seeing here? Bank of America, BOA, making a move into Kentucky, a little, little footprint expansion. 
Yeah, second largest bank in America opening 10 Louisville branches, and I believe five of them are supposed to open next year. Yeah, I, not not at all surprised. Um, in fact, Bank of America was one of my largest clients when I was liquidating bank foreclosures, REO properties. They, they acquired Countrywide. I had Countrywide as a client. That was a former employer of mine when I was in the mortgage business back in the day. And so kind of what happened is loss mitigation department at Countrywide um, – you know, and that, that was a crazy story. I mean, maybe someday we'll talk about that. But Countrywide was like the nation's largest mortgage lender. And then all of a sudden, 2008, they were out of business. And they sold for $2 billion. Previous market cap was something like $50 bill. Wow. And Bank of America bought them for $2 billion, okay, which they inherited all their bad debt, okay, which the government kind of backstopped. We won't get too deep into that. But the loss mitigation department was so well flushed out at Countrywide because they were getting ready <laughs> to handle this big, you know, glut of foreclosures that basically Bank of America just kept all those employees. They kept all their agents in line. So I just kind of like slid over a chair. It was like, okay, your countrywide's agent. Fantastic. Now you're Bank of America's. So um, one of the qualifications that a lot of the banks used to try to do is they wanted their bank to issue pre-approval letters on any financed offers on, on their, on their foreclosed property. But Bank of America really didn't have a local presence. So that was very obvious. There were a couple loan officers. They had some LOs that they hired that would work, just simply mortgage office people, not banks. This looks like banking centers, though, with tellers yeah. and deposits and the whole nine. Was it, were, were they like the first remote workers ever? No, they had an office. They had offices usually like in real estate companies. So there was one at another Remax office in town, and I think that was pretty much it. There was like three or four LOs. That was all. They weren't remote workers, though. Yeah believe it or not. But it was not, a, it was not fun. They, they had one really good loan officer that I liked, but other than that, it was not fun to work with them. Yeah. It's definitely never a bad thing when banks are more banks are moving into your city. No, it's not it's ever. Great. It it absolutely looks good. And, 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 you know, with the regional bank kind of challenges that we've seen, Louisville is certainly dominated by regional banking. You know, you've got Chase here, obviously, and Chase is the number one, number one largest bank in the country. Um, I think that's pretty well documented, but um, another large, we don't, we don't have Wells here. Wells is probably number three. Um, so it's, it's nice to see bank of America making an investment in our community. It says, I think it says a lot about where we are as a local economy. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. It's good to see. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. And it didn't say how many jobs it would create, but you think it's going to create a decent amount. I mean, if you just talk about 10 banking centers with probably 20 employees each, it's probably 200 employees. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. It's not nothing. That's good. All right. Uh, talked a little bit about 2008 crash. So this is a good lead into Segway. something I saw going all over Twitter this yeah. week. I'm sure you saw it. I did. I shared it. Yeah. Okay. I shared it on you our, wanna, you on our, take it? On our company. No, you go ahead. Set it up. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to comment. Yeah. So basically it's just this article came out saying our fallen revenues per listing. So revenues per listing for Airbnb came out significantly less than they were the last few weeks. And there's people going around saying it's going to cause a housing crash on par with 2008 because these Airbnb owners are going to have to start selling these homes because they're not making as much revenue as they were. Well, okay. So two things can be true at once. Um, I think Airbnb sellers could be forced to sell some property. I think Anything, anytime real estate investment is predicated upon two to three to four X long term rental rates. So, so for example, you buy a house in Louisville, you pay $300,000 for it in the Highlands. It's a starter home in the Highlands. That home is going to rent for anywhere 1800 to probably $2,500 a month. Okay. So, less than 1%. If you follow some of the you know, very same real estate investment gurus. They tell you to strive for 1% of your purchase price in gross monthly rent, right? So if 300, 3000, the higher you ascend in price, the less, the less, uh, you know, feasible that is, right. um, you know, probably the most feasible is like your 90 grand for 900 a month. If you want, if you know, but once you start ascending, it, it becomes harder and harder to get there. So, if you can buy a $300,000 house and rent it for $2,500 a month, that's great. It's great. You might be able to positive cash flow that at current rates. 
Probably not. It's probably slightly yeah. slightly below, slightly negative cash flow. Doesn't mean it's a bad investment if you have a high income and you can offset with earned income or you know investment income from another rental property that you bought at a cheaper price before prices ran up. Still not a bad idea to invest. Okay, what these people are saying and what they're positing is that some of these Airbnb owners at peak have seen three to four times that amount of revenue in a month by renting their property out, almost like a hotel on STR sites, short-term rental sites like Airbnb and VRBO. So all of a sudden, that 2,500 becomes 7,500. Okay, fantastic. It's great. It takes a lot of effort. I mean, a lot of people believe even quit their jobs, quit their day jobs and bought mm-hmm. Airbnbs, and they literally run around and refresh toilet paper and air fresheners all day, <laughs> you know, and K-cups. Not not diminishing it. That's work. Oh, that's and, and, if, and if people are pay, willing to pay for it, then more power to you. It looked like a bit of a bubble to me, okay? And, I'm, and, and I do think STR is here to stay through these sites because some people just have grown to appreciate it more than staying in a hotel. It was bound to happen that revenues would drop. So, okay, you go, what happens when you can get 7,500 instead of 2,500? Well, you're, you're willing to pay 350 and 400 for that house under a competitive market rather than the 300 that you really should have paid. So prices have escalated. When these people start getting, you know, 3500 a month and they paid 350 instead of getting 7500 a month because they're seeing a 50% dis- decrease in revenues. Yeah, now all of a sudden that investment looks really bad. Okay? Because that 3500 even though it's more than long-term rental, it's not stable. They they'll get 3500 this month, they'll get 27 mm-hmm. next 100 next month, they'll get a $2000, you know, expense that crops up that wouldn't in a in a long-term rental situation. So, yes, they're going to start selling, but there's not enough of them out there, okay, to to off balance our, our supply and demand dynamics to make a market crash. So it's probably healthy, like most market shifts are. Uh, unfortunate for those who got a little greedy, right, and did a little too much, yep. took a little too much risk. They might get hurt a little bit, but I don't think it crashes the real estate market. Yeah, I don't think so either, especially if you start really looking at the data. So here you have, in this article, economist Jamie Lane, senior vice president at AirDNA, the company, they track performance and monitor trends in short-term rentals, argue the data is inaccurate and revenues per listing are down in 2023 for Airbnb, but they've not dropped by 40%, but by 3%. 3%. Big difference. <laughs> yeah. Big, big difference. I don't know where they're getting their data from. Um, it was you know. all the rooms is who ran the study. Okay. I'm guessing they just checked places like Phoenix and Houston and other popular. If you notice that Nashville was toward the top of the list, but also Sevierville, Tennessee, which is a suburb of Nashville. And that was a separate listing. And it was Sevierville was like number two. Mm-hmm. I think Phoenix was number one in decline and Sevierville, Tennessee was number two. Which Sevierville is like the size of Elizabeth town. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's tiny. It's tiny compared to the size of Nashville. So the fact that it belongs on a list it, it was made me skeptical because it's the fact that it was even on the list with Phoenix and Nashville. Yeah. Like, you know, I'll tell you, uh, Airbnb, I think there's a, sh- a consumer shift where people are like, yeah, it's good for big groups. But if you're just traveling by yourself now or with a spouse or just a friend, I think people are switching back to hotels are better. I They're like, almost cheaper now, too. I and like so hotels. People clean your room. I love it. You don't have to worry about anything. If you're just traveling with your spouse, you're not going to make anything in the kitchen. Like, no, come abso- on. absolutely. What's not. the point of having the house? I I, I enjoy hotels better. I yeah. just do. And I've seen people talk about it on Twitter. I think I think it is a consumer shift going on right now. And I think what's keeping a lot of these Airbnbs going in these big cities, honestly, bachelor and bachelorette parties. That's 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 something. I mean, gr- group travel is is it's cool for group travel. Like, yeah, I like going like. You know, I like going to the beach and, you know, getting in, you staying in a six bedroom house with five other couples and, you know, getting away from the kids for a few days. That's cool. But, you know, that's always been the case with beach rentals, too. You know, those are not necessarily Airbnb anymore. But anyway, I think that's about all the time we got for segment three. Uh, we'll be right back after a couple of words from our sponsors. We'll wrap up this week's show. Stay with us. This is Jay Pitts on the Jay Pitts Show. Talk Radio 1080. Welcome back to the Jay Pitch Show. I'm your co-host, Ryan Harris. Talk Radio 1080, Real News, Real Talk. 
All right. We haven't really talked any sports. We'll talk about it real quick. And I doubt you've seen this. Uh huh. But there is have you heard of enhanced sports? I have not. It is Olympics the Olympics without drug testing. Oh. Yeah, so an Australian so, entrepreneur is trying to rival the Olympic Games with an alternative competition that accepts and encourages the use of performance-enhancing drugs. I think that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, like, you got to watch it just for, like, powerlifting, right? Like, like see if these guys can, like, throw up, like, a thousand-pound bench press or something crazy. Like, I don't even know. Like, all the Olympic sports? Not all of them. I'm trying to find it in the article. It's it's a lot of the track events. Yeah. So obviously hmm. the sprints and I think probably shot put and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, I think it's cool. So there is a video on their website. It's pretty much the one they're using for all the marketing right now. And there's this guy in it. it doesn't show his face. Nobody knows his name, but has beaten... Uh, Usain Bolt's record for the, I guess it's the hundred yard, the hundred meter, da- hundred meters. Yeah. Well, he's got the world record on the hundred and the two hundred, I think. Yeah. So he's beat his hundred meter world record, and he's ha- nobody knows his name or his face. I guess it's going to be revealed whenever this takes place. Well, that's a marketing genius right there. Oh, and that better be, that, so smart. That better be legit. Well, because I'm sitting here thinking while you're explaining it, like. Are they really going to get, like, how many athletes, how many, like, drug-enhanced athletes are they going to be able to find that are better than the actual, like, world-class athletes? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, can you find somebody faster than Usain Bolt just because they juice? Like, I don't know because that dude was a freak, right? And, like, Michael Phelps and, like, anyway, go ahead. So here's the categories. I found it. Track and field, swimming, weightlifting, gymnastics and combat sports combat sports. i don't think the combat sports one's smart what are they what 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 kind of combat sports uh is boxing and uh, yeah i guess okay yeah that's got to be it so mma maybe i don't, I don't, I don't know. even know if that's an olympic sport i don't know speaking of which speaking of juicing and sports did you see i have yet to watch it wednesday the first episode of the american gladiators uh docuseries hit netflix are you familiar no. with american gladiators I am a little bit. Yes. Oh, you're too young. I remember watching it okay. at some point. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think it would be worth your time. It's okay. it's Americana for sure. Like it's it's well, it's it's millennial Americana. It's it's Gen X Americana. It's like, you know, it used to come on on like what, like Saturday nights at like eleven PM. Um, or Friday nights. It might have been Friday nights. I don't think it wanted to compete with SNL back in the day. But like and it was like crazy and it was like legit. And and the the um the trailer to hear some of these people talk, and I remember these characters, right? Um it, it was legit just like steroid induced, like roid rage craziness. And it, and it was like no filter. Like they there was no safety, there was no filter. I mean, this was like the nineteen nineties, eighties at its best. Like these people would like literally just wail on each other in these games. And people got hurt and they just all right, I'm sold. Yeah, got to do it. Anyway, I'm going to go back. I, I didn't watch the first episode yet because, um, you know, I had some stuff going on, but it supposedly hit Netflix last night. Okay. I might watch that tonight. I'll just have to talk my wife into it, <laughs> but I'm going to try. All right. So are we going to talk about this tortoise situation? Yeah, let, let's jump All over right, to let's, that. Let's go. All right. So random question. We've done these. <laughs> they've gone. They've done really well on social media. This is probably the dumbest one we've done yet. <laughs> Jay sent it to me. I don't even know who comes up with these things, but I'm going to ask you. We'll talk through it, and we'll talk through it. It'll probably make people mad, even though it means nothing. So the question is, you could get $5 million right now in your bank account, but there's a catch. A tortoise is chasing you for the rest of your life, and if it touches you, you die. It knows your location at all times. Its only purpose is to find you. It cannot be killed and will live forever. Do you take the money? It's slow, though, because it is a tortoise. 
I, I'm literally on the stair climber at the gym the other day looking at Twitter and saw this and sent it to Ryan immediately. And I said, should this be a show question? Yeah. You, don't, you didn't really even have to ask the question. No, I like, knew you it was just coming sent up. The tweet. I literally just, I literally just looked down and yeah. saw it on the rundown and started laughing immediately. All right. Five I, million bucks. I think it's an incredibly easy answer. Okay. So I'm not going to say mine. I promise I will, I will not change my answer because I, it, it's a very, very like open and shut for me too. Okay. You okay. So you want me to go first? You go first. I'm taking that money so fast and I'm flying to another country where the tortoise has to go across water or hitch a ride on a boat or an airplane or something. And I'll just fly around to different countries for a few years where they have to go across the water. For the rest of your life, Ryan. Yeah. Okay. So here's, here's my answer. My answer is absolutely not. Absolutely. I don't want to look over my shoulder for this tortoise for the rest of my life. Do you know what? Which tortoise it is is the question. That's the thing. Any could be any tortoise. Like I'd have irrational tortoise fear for the rest of my life. I couldn't go to any any zoos anymore. I'm telling you, man, you got to say no. Probably a phobia out there. You got to say no, thank you to the five mil because that tortoise, if he touches you, you're dead. Oh, that is the wrong answer. Just can't even touch you. No, 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 no. (laughs) I can't believe it. Just flying like, around. Ryan and his no shoes and his iPhone are going to be running from a tortoise for the rest of his life. <laughs> I have an iPhone though. You do. So I'm good. Can you put like, could you put like one of those, one of those Apple badges on the tortoise so that you could track him? You could. So thank you. I'm definitely still <laughs> taking the money with that. <laughs> oh gosh. I don't even know. Where, like seriously, where do we come up with these things? Twitter is where Twitter Twitter and what do you think? Just, just be, let's be real. I understand your answer, and uh, I think you understand mine. What, what do you think the ratio of people surveyed would be on this answer? Ninety ten. Ninety percent of people would say yes. Ninety percent of people would take it. So, what does it say about me that I wouldn't? You have too much money. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to live in fear for the rest of my life. Of, uh, of a, of I think. A, I think people. I think it's worse. I think that people he's slow. like thinking through things like this, and they're not thinking of how the tortoise is going to get on. They're thinking of how can the tortoise never get them, and somebody's going to come up with something like I said, like fly across the world, and that's why most people are going to say yes. <laughs> I I still don't know. I like I don't uh I mean, I don't know about you, but like I also think I don't want to live that kind of life where I run I'm running away from a tortoise to another country for five I mean, if 5 million is not enough to get me to do that. You said for a few years. So what if you you live it up on your 5 million for the next 5 years and then you come back and try to settle down and then you die cuz you got touched by a tortoise? I don't know. I mean, some people travel the world with no well, money. Well, yes, we we both know an individual, but um, <laughs> that's I'm not putting that out there. You know, I'm I'm not. I'm definitely not. It's it's worse that it's slow. It's worse that it's slow. If it was a fast, what are you mostly worried about when you're sleeping? Well, of course. Well, why don't you just sleep in like a box? <laughs> because the tortoise is going to find a way, man. It's its only purpose in life. Uh, tortoises have been around for millions of years. Like they're pretty smart. You know, it's, it could be a blessing to have <laughs> something that only purpose in life is to find you. <laughs> I don't, I, I really don't know about that. I don't I, see. Here's the thing. We got three minutes left and I don't know where we're going to go from. Here, I do. Ryan. Where, you, I know you, where. You, you know where we're going. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to, so, so real quick, put a bow on it. Ryan will take your money. Jay Pitts will not. All right, Ryan, what else we got? All right, we're going to switch from the tortoise to let's talk about the Remax scramble we do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's lo- a uh, lovely segue. Yeah. Um, no, no, we put on a charity golf scramble every October. It's actually going to be our second annual. I shouldn't say every because it's only going to be our second. Hurstmore Country Club, I believe it is the 17th of October this year. Um, we would definitely love to have you if you'd like to support Children's Miracle Network. We put on a pretty good show. We had a lot of teams last year. How many teams did we have last year? 
Like uh, 24? Yeah, which is a lot for a scramble. Yeah, 24 teams, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of industry folks, a lot of, uh, a lot of very, very benevolent individuals that love supporting children. We raised over 25000 for Children's Miracle Network, which benefits Norton's Children's Hospital here locally. Um, you know, our office raised over 50000 last year for, for CMN to benefit children over at Norton. So... It's something that we like to do to give back service and and support of folks that are less fortunate of us. And that then we are is something that is very, very um, near and dear to our culture as a company and children's cancer, children's charities. Those are things that we're very passionate about. Yeah. And, you know, you can support Bob playing in it, being a sponsor. Uh, who should they reach out to? If you can, you can reach out to me. You can find me, you know, anywhere that you find the show. You can DM me on social. We can get you a link to sign up. Um, you know, we've got we've got a nice little website built for registration and all that. My wife Jen. You can also reach out to her on the socials. You can go through the Remax Premier Properties social channels. All that stuff is is really easy to find us. Yeah, I would definitely just go to honestly social search J Pitts. It should pop up. I'll tell you, I had major FOMO last year. I was on my honeymoon. It looked like a great, great time, but uh, definitely not missing it this year. But I think that's all we have now. Yeah, that's it. That's all we got for the day. You know, so come back next week. We appreciate you. It is how it is a holiday weekend. Enjoy your fourth. Uh, we appreciate you each and every week. Come back for another ridiculous question to close out segment four next year. I might be next next week. I might be getting chased by a by a hair. Or something a little faster. Anyway, we appreciate you. For the J. Pitts Show, Ryan Harris, I am your host, J. Pitts. Talk Radio 1080. We'll see you soon.